Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Last week, Pastor Matt preached uh, James 1, uh, 19 through 21. And in that passage was an exhortation to receive the implanted word, the word of God, which is able to save your souls. And I think it's tempting for Christians or those who identify as Christians uh, to believe that immersing themselves in the study of the word and reading uh, Christian books will inevitably cause them to be more virtuous and more faithful. Some people might imagine that increasing in knowledge of the Bible is not only the main thing that Christians do, but it's really the only thing that's necessary. We might conclude that what pleases our Heavenly Father and what makes us more mer uh, virtuous is knowing more about the Bible that attending more Bible studies, we are demonstrating maybe a willingness to sacrifice our time, our effort, our energy, and that by doing that, we are doing the essential task of Christian discipleship. But James is going to burst that bubble in this passage this morning. The, the Lord is not impressed with the sacrifice of our time, of our energy, and our effort to attend Bible studies, or even to dedicate to personal time in, uh, in study and prayer, nor is he impressed with how much we know about the Bible, listen to me, if, if we are not willing to obey what we know. That's the key. So let's read the passage. And then I'll pray, and then we'll jump into it, okay? Yeah, and by the way, let me just say here also, thank you for praying for me two weeks ago. I was, I had a, I was sick, and I said some funny things about fishing, and you know, I went back and watched that again. Now, you know, Pastor Matt's uh, apology, I'm not going to apologize to the fishermen. Maybe it was convicting to some of you, uh, but it was a joke anyway. But I was sick last week, and I was really afraid that I was going to get sick on the plane, and people were going to think I had COVID and all this kind of stuff. It was just a stomach ache. But, uh, but I left here and felt fine the rest of the trip. So thank you very much for praying for me. All right, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. Lord, we want to see your glory. We want to recognize your glory. And so my first prayer, Lord, our first prayer is that you would help us to see your glory in your word. And that we would be that we would glorify you uh, in how we even listen to the word. That even now our hearts would be uh, attentive and tuned in to the word, and that we would we would be coming here to desire to be changed by it. That we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. And Father, now I'm also reminded of the fact that. Uh, Christians, the church in Ukraine, are gathering together to worship you at great risk. And they have stayed in their country in order to serve. They have stayed in their cities in order to be the hands and feet of Jesus, knowing that, that Russian troops are there. It's imminent. It's happening. They're losing their lives. They're losing their homes. They are trusting in you, Lord. What an example for us today. I pray, Lord, for the, for the church uh, in Ukraine, and Lord, they're not the only ones suffering, but I pray specifically for the church in Ukraine that you would strengthen them, and I pray that their witness and their testimony would be convicting to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. James says in verse 22, be doers of the word, 
and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. There's a big difference between knowing the Bible and obeying what it says. There's a big difference between being knowledgeable about the Bible, acing the Bible trivias, and being wise in our living. Those who know a lot about the Bible, but that do not approach the Word, seeking to be conformed to it in their hearts so that their lives are changed, are deceiving themselves, James says. I hope you're hearing. They're deceiving themselves. Paul says knowledge does what? Puffs up. By knowledge, what Paul is talking about and what I would refer to here is just knowing doctrine and knowing Scripture and going from one Bible study to another Bible study to another Bible study, informing the mind but not being transformed in the heart. If our approach to the Word is not transforming how we actually live, then we're just deceiving ourselves. Now, let me be, be very clear. We must pursue knowledge of the Word. James is not advocating for biblical illiteracy or anti-intellectualism. Usually, what we replace with Anti, with intellectualism is emotionalism. Both of these are error. We must be hearers of the word. He says, do not be hearers only, implying what? That we are hearing the word, that we are going to Bible studies, we are sitting under biblical preaching, that we are having our own daily quiet time in the word. We must hear in order to do. Otherwise, what are we doing? We're doing whatever feels right. Well, when was the last time that your heart led you to do what was right when it wasn't governed by the Word? All right, James is not suggesting anti-intellectualism or biblical illiteracy. He's telling us that unless the hearing of the Word leads us to be doers of the Word, then we have not truly heard the Word. Do you understand? Unless hearing the Word leads you to do something, to, to be convicted, to repent, to change, to be changed, to desire to be changed, then you have not actually heard the word at all. Now, let me take a moment here to pause, because this could get really heavy really quick, and I said from the beginning, I, I don't want you to come in here and be beat up every Sunday, right? I want you to keep coming back. So let's take a moment here to pause and, and state that James is going to lay down some biblical principles, some practical examples of what demonstrates faith and what disproves faith. But none of us is going to execute this perfectly. We're going to find ourselves, like Paul, doing the things we don't want to do and not doing the things that we want to do. And so I think John MacArthur's encouragement here is beautiful. The key, he says, is not perfection, but rather hating our imperfection and striving by the power that the Holy Spirit works in us to rid ourselves of it. So as we look at what it means to approach the Word of God to be uh, transformed, what we're talking about is a pattern of life. If you walk out of one of my sermons and you think, what in the world did Brian just say? I got nothing out of that, right? Hypothetically, I'm sure it's never happened to you, but hypothetically, it could happen at some point in your life. You could walk out of the doors and say, I got nothing. Okay, maybe I just dropped the ball. However, if you habitually walk out those doors without feeling conviction, without feeling the Holy Spirit leading you, if you can't point to a persistent and continual conviction. When I, when I come and I hear the Word of God preach, whether it's Pastor Brian or Pastor Matt or any of the elders or anyone else, that I hear the Word of God correctly and faithfully expounded, and I don't feel conviction by it, that is a warning sign. That's a check engine light on your car, right? Right? And I don't want you to be deceived. You need to repent 
and you need to believe the gospel, that's a warning sign. The gospel has both a saving power. You can note Romans 1.16, the saving power of the gospel, but it also summons us to radical obedience. If you're only related to the gospel by the saving power of God, if, all the, if, if you just say, I just don't want to go to hell, I just want to go to heaven, but you don't relate to the summons to radical obedience, then you have not truly understood or embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. You would do well to hear the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? And again in John 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus says this. You're my friends if you do what I command you. He boiled genuine love for him down to one thing, obedience. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then, as if to add emphasis and to be super clear about this so that there's no confusion, then he states it in the negative. If anyone, whoever does not love me, does not keep my words. I think it would be faithful to say it in the opposite and say, if you don't keep the words of Jesus, you don't love Jesus. This is what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a born-again believer. He causes us to love Jesus, and love for Jesus causes us to obey Jesus. Don't be deceived. Someone who professes to believe Jesus with a saving faith yet does not despise uh, dis, uh, demonstrate or display a continual pull towards dis, uh, to obedience. Excuse me. Let me read that again. I blundered that. Someone who professes a faith in Jesus but does not feel the continual pull to obedience to him has only that, a profession of faith. Heed the warning of Paul, who, heard, uh, who uh, encouraged the Corinthian church, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Examine yourselves. Test your yourselves. Anyone who hears the word but does nothing with it deceives himself about his relationship with Jesus Christ. And to illustrate how self-evidently true this is, James uses an illustration of a man looking into a mirror. So let's look here at verses 23 and 24. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Now, unlike for us, we have to remember James wrote to an actual audience, and for them, mirrors as we know them were not a common commodity. They were not silver-lined glass, and they didn't have them in every bathroom, every car visor, and every woman's purse. No, they were polished metal, and they were rare. So I want you to think about, you go to a state park, and you go to the public restroom, and those like stainless steel mirrors that are polished or, or to an athletic stadium, it, it, it's not glass, it's, it's stainless steel, and maybe it's warped, and, and it, it, it gives you a, enough to know if you've got mustard on your cheek from the hot dog, but it, not enough to really get a good look. And so James uses a compound verb here when he says, looks at himself in the mirror. So this man, in the illustration, gets the rare occasion to get a mirror, and, and he's curious about himself. Right, you, you and I see mirrors all the time, and we may ha do a passing glance, uh, or maybe some of us don't want to look in the mirror, uh, but, but it's common for us. Well, here's a man who gets the unusual occasion to get a mirror, and he looks intently. He looks carefully. He's noticing the wrinkles. Oh, I, when did I get that one? He, he's noticing the scraggly beard, the gray that's coming out. He's noticing the teeth. He's noticing these things. He's perceiving these things. However, as soon as he goes away, he totally forgets what he was like. It had no impact on his life. He, he, he didn't go out and, and slick his hair back and, and, and smooth his beard down and, and get that stuff out of his teeth. No, he just forgets about it. He doesn't do anything with it. 
And the mirror here for James is symbolic of the Word of God. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the, mirror is like, uh, the Word is like a mirror of our soul. It reveals to us who we really are, not who we want to be, not who we've pretended to be, not who we've convinced others that we are, but who we really are. And when we look carefully at the Word, we see it. We see what we're really like, our natural face, who we truly are when we look at the Word. And it shows us that we are sinful, and it shows the real depth of our sin. Right? We want to imagine that our sin is not as bad as it really is. But when we look at the Word of God, it reveals to us just how messed up we really are. And what a shame that something similar happens when people approach the Word of God as the man does the mirror. They sit under preaching and teaching. They carve out time to read it on their own. And then they walk away and their minds immediately shift to the next thing. It doesn't land. It doesn't impact. Here's why. They don't approach the time that they've spent with the desire to be changed by it. They did not pray last night. Lord, I'm going to gather with my family in the Lord to worship you. I'm going to enter into your presence lifting up a song of praise. I'm going to join with my family in praying together, and then I'm going to hear the Word of God preached faithfully expounded, not the pastor's opinion, but what your word says, and God, my anticipation and hope and expectation is that I will be changed. They don't do that. They don't wake up Sunday morning ready, rested, to give attention, to give their hearts affection. They don't do that They don't approach the Word of God this way, and so it doesn't stick. It was a waste of time. It becomes a waste of time for that person. Someone who looks carefully at the Word of God, who sees themselves in their sin and the holiness of God and does nothing with that, is like the man with the mirror. And that's a tragedy. But let's get positive. There's a blessing here. James continues, there's a blessing. There's a flip side, amen? There's a flip side. There's a blessing in the Word of God. So let's continue with verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So James uses an even stronger verb for looking when he says looks into, the one who looks into. This is a type of looking that causes one to to get a better angle, perhaps by stooping over to get a better look. They want to really be careful. They really want to see. It's used twice in John chapter 20, in verse 5 and verse 11, to describe how Peter and then Mary Magdalene stooped over and looked into the tomb. This is a careful, purposeful looking. This is a looking that is seeking to gain something. You see what I'm saying? We're not just watching the TV. We're mining for gold. Amen? Right? You need to think about what this is that we're doing. I'm not here to entertain, even though sometimes you might laugh. Some, you might laugh at me. Sometimes you laugh with me. Uh, but this isn't entertainment. This is mining for gold, right? That's what I spent all week doing. And then coming here and saying, look at the gold. And then saying, you can also go gold mining, right? Let's be gold miners. Maybe, I don't know, maybe... Spiritual gold miners, not gold diggers. <laughs> All right, so the perfect law, the law of liberty is what? It's the gospel. It's the word of God. It includes the books of the Old Testament. 
It also includes the teaching of Jesus because Jesus fulfilled the law, and now it includes the words of the apostles who spoke on authority of Jesus who fulfilled the law. Several commentators note that it's perfect because it's, one, it's God's perfect word, and it reflects his perfect character. It's also perfectly suited for life in this world. It tells us how to live, how to do life, and because it is perfectly fulfilled. And because it's perfectly fulfilled, it results in freedom. Jesus fulfilled the law and gave us liberty, the law of liberty. And the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, is someone who seeks communion with God, with, his, or with him in the word. Listen, you want to hear from the Lord? Open the word. You want to understand God's will for your life? Open the word. You want to understand how to lead your family, submit to your husband, work at your job, stand up under persecution? Open the word. This is where you find life and liberty. God said to his people through the prophet Jeremiah, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's what James means when he uses the phrase, looks into. It means seeking and finding the Lord because you have sought him with all of your heart. You've stooped over. You've looked in. You're going to the word not just to gain information, but you are going to commune with the living God. Amen? This looking into the law and finding the Lord there is what enables you to persevere through trials of life. The person who looks into the Word enters into what I'm calling a persevering cycle of meeting with God, of connecting with Him in the Word, of coming face to face with who you really are, with your sin nature, and then repenting of that sin, just like Isaiah did in Isaiah 6. He beholds the glory of God. And what is his response? He says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. When we behold the glory of God in his word, and we recognize who we really are, it causes us to repent. And then what happens when we repent? The Lord forgives God sent an angel with a coal to touch his mouth and make him clean. And we say, God, how can you be so gracious again? And then when we're filled with the grace of God, we're encouraged to go out and live for his glory, strengthened by the knowledge of who I am and whose I am. And then being drawn back to the word for more of the same. You see, we go out strengthened. So we meet with the Lord. We see his glory. We repent. We're forgiven. We're encouraged. We go out into the world and we, we, we remain steadfast. We, we're standing up. Even if we get knocked down, we get back up. We're remaining steadfast. We're enduring the trials of life. And then enduring those trials calls us back to the wellspring of God's grace in his word once again. If I could describe what is the weekly rhythm, it's Christians being built up, being seeing the vision of the glory of God from his word, leaving encouraged by his grace into a hard, hard world. Going to the Word on a daily basis, enduring trials one after another after another, going back to the Word, being encouraged by the Word, encouraging others with the Word, and then coming back into the building. Wash, rinse, repeat. You need the church, and you need the Word. Amen? This person is a doer of the word, not just a hearer who forgets what he heard, but he perpetually does. 
He's, he's a doer who acts. It won't go in one ear and out the other. It doesn't puff him up. The doer of the word is concerned with more than just learning about the word, more than gaining facts about it. The doer of the word is seeking truth. Are you a truth seeker? Are you looking for truth for life? This doer of the word looks for truth. And so when he hears truth, he applies it to his life. Right? You find out something is true, you generally live by it. Otherwise, you don't believe it's true. It changes how this person lives, how he thinks about all of his life, and it gives courage to step out in faith. It gives the courage to go out there into the world and endure and to do hard things that he knows are the right things. It fills a person with conviction. And brother and sister, we need more Christians with conviction. And I don't just mean conviction of sin, though it must begin there. A a man that says, I'm convicted about your sin? No. (laughs) First convicted about his own sin, and then goes out with conviction to stand on truth. Take Pastor Matt, for instance. Last week, he used that illustration in his sermon. It made people uncomfortable. It came across as making light of lying. When confronted by a godly and, I would say, convicted man in our church after the sermon, Pastor Matt then felt convicted to issue an apology. He sought counsel from the elders what you should all do. We're all able to seek counsel from the elders. He says, is there something to this? Do I need to know this? Do I need to repent of this? And the Holy Spirit convicted him, yes, you should repent. And he issued the apology. And, And like me, he believes that when something is stated publicly, it should be repented of publicly. And I'm so grateful for you, Matt. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit working in your heart. You're a doer of the Word. When we begin to experience real-life change from the Word of God, we stop approaching the hour of study flippantly. When we begin to experience how the the Word of God is true and it has something to say about my life, my marriage, my parenting, my sex life, my entertainment life, my finances, and I start applying the principles and, and my life begins to flourish because I'm obeying the truth, then we stop approaching the hour of study flippantly. We come expectantly. We come thirsty for life and hungry for righteousness and longing for liberty. And those that do are going to be blessed, James says. And so does Jesus, John 13. Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you, what? If you do them. That just makes sense. Jesus gives words of life, words of truth. If you live by them, what can you expect? Blessing. If you don't live by them, what can you expect? Hardship frustration, right? When you and I humbly and sincerely look into the Word, when we seek the Lord with all our hearts, and when we see ourselves as we truly are, and when we do something about it, when we, by the help and direction of the Holy Spirit, submit our lives, align our actions and our attitudes and our words with God's Word, we build for ourselves a strong foundation for life. Listen to what Jesus says. Luke 6, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. What a fool, right? Who builds, who's, who builds a house on the dirt? A fool does. Okay? When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. 
Do you want, here's an honest question for you, do you want a life that endures trials, tests, storms, floods, or do you want one that easily collapses? You want a marriage that's going to stand? You want finances that are going to stand? You want, you want to be a parent that stands? Then obey the Word. Hear and obey. Hear and obey. Know what Jesus says and do what Jesus says. Is that complicated? No. Is it hard? Sometimes. Because why? Because we're sinful. And we want to do it our way. And like, like a toddler who repeatedly wants to do it their way and messes up, we think we can do things better than God. Let's just say the moronic part out loud. We think we can do life better than God. Right? James concludes this important section here, verses 2 through 27, uh, on practical implications of true Christianity by signaling three specific ways that we manifest obedience to the Word. Keep in mind, this is not exhaustive. This is not the only thing that you do, but it serves as a sort of roadmap for the rest of the letter. James knows that the true litmus test of genuine faith is not the type of religion that many people uh, do and, and live by, routinely perform, with heartless devotion and liturgy and confession. Rather, it's a posture of the heart that works its way to the surface in practical ways. Let's read verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. If you think that you're religious and you can't control your tongue, James says that your religion is worthless. That is a strong statement, is it not? Worthless. He's going to unpack that in chapter 3. He's going to spend 12 verses on that, where he says, with the same tongue we curse others and bless the Lord. Obviously, that can't be right. See, these things are not, this isn't rocket science. These things are not complex. Jesus says in Luke 6, 45, the, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. Here's a hardcore truth. The mouth has a way of revealing what is in your heart. That's why Paul links both a verbal confession and a heart belief to salvation. Romans, 9, or Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The mouth confesses what the heart truly believes. Now, we can fake it till we make it, so to speak, but only for so long. We can go through the motions, but when we're really put to the test, our mouths will speak the truth of what is really in our hearts. Easy times make it easy to fake it. We are entering church into hard times. Do you believe what I'm saying? We are entering into hard times. You need to know now what you believe. Because when you are put to the test, your mouth will confess what you believe in your heart. And that's why Jesus says, if anyone denies me before men, I'll deny him before the Father. In other words, he never had your heart. You deny with your mouth, he never had your heart. With the, the mouth, one speaks what is in the heart. Easy times make it easy to fake it till we make it, to go through the motions, but we are entering into hard times, church. Get right with the Lord today. The problem with self-deception 
is that people can fool themselves easily and others easily into believing that their superficial, empty religion, what James would call worthless, is sincere. The Pharisees are case in point. They had such an empty religion, and yet they fooled everyone. People looked at the Pharisees as if they were God on earth. They they were just righteous. And yet, what did Jesus say? Jesus said they honored God with their lips while their hearts were far from him. They did all the rituals. They did all the ceremonies. They said all the right words. Listen to me. They affirmed all the right doctrines. But at some point, sooner or later, their mouths would reveal what was really in their heart toward God. And from the beginning of Jesus' ministry to the end, they condemned Jesus with their mouths, even to death. Religious people who loved the Word, who memorized, who strictly obeyed the law, killed God's Son. With their own mouths, they condemned him to death. A religion that does not change the heart and thereby change the tongue is totally worthless in God's sight. Now, the tongue... James will later say, if you can control the tongue, then you can control the whole body. It says that in James chapter 3. So this really isn't so much a message about just what we say, but rather about total self-control. It's a message about more than just what you say, but how you live your whole life. You can go to church, you can tithe perfectly, you can memorize scripture, you can graduate from seminary and still have a worthless religion. Unless there's a change of heart resulting in a change of living, most demonstrably by a change in how you speak, then your religion is worthless. Remember what I said at the beginning. We're all going to slip up from time to time. There's a heaviness. Okay, shake it off. We're just, all right, we're going to get there. The key is not perfection. You're like, I said a curse word the other day. I gossiped the other day. I criticized the other day. I complained the other day. All sin. Be clear, all sin. Am I self-deceived? Remember, the key is not perfection, but hating our imperfection. We're all going to slip up from time to time. We're going to get involved in gossip, false accusation, complaining, criticism, cursing. But James is talking about a person who habitually fails to control his tongue. So let me just state this. If you habitually give people a verbal lashing, use curse words, gossip, criticize, complain, and you don't see these as sin in need of repentance, then James says your religion is worthless. Be honest with yourself. Because eternity is too long to be wrong. You're getting it, church. I'm rubbing off on you a little bit. It's too long to be wrong. Right? From worthless religion now to worthy religion. Okay, let's turn the page here. James turns to an expression of religion which pleases the Lord. Let's read verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. For James, the right religion is not based on what we believe to be best or right, nor what the world believes to be right, nor even, hear me, what other Christians believe to be right. Religion that is right is religion that is pure and undefiled in the sight of God or before God the Father. In other words, right 
is what God determines to be right, not what makes you feel right. Tracking? You can have the greatest emotional experience and feel so connected and have a worthless religion. Right is what God determines to be right. James uses two synonymous words here to emphasize right religion. Pure, which means clean, and undefiled, which means uncontaminated. Two synonymous words to add emphasis. Pure and undefiled. They mean the same thing. He wants to emphasize. He says, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Now, once again, not exhaustive, but rather, this is a type of genuine, pure, undefiled religion. This is religion that is acceptable in God's sight. This is to really care for people who need care the most. These are those who are least capable of providing care for themselves and from whom one could least expect tangible return for their care, right? Those toddlers, Kelly, that we had, they weren't exactly paying us back, were they? Dang, toddlers. <laughs> right? Least likely to expect to receive anything tangible, right? We got something out of it, right? Well, we got a lot of things out of it, but <laughs> tangible. So in the New Testament, the phrase to visit carries with it this connotation of going to someone with the intention of helping in practical ways. Not just, ministry of presence is good, but James is going to warn us against saying, be warm and well fed. Good luck. No, no, to visit implies more than just going to be with them and to talk to them, though that could be useful and helpful, but it means with the intention of helping, of doing something, of alleviating their suffering. And we, uh, let's see here, where am I? Sorry. I get excited and get ahead of my notes here. By carefully and specifically caring for the widows and orphans, we also demonstrate, ready, that we have understood the gospel at its core, that we've truly understood the gospel and that we've connected with the very heart of God, who is especially the father of the fatherless those who have been adopted into the family of God as ones previously spiritually fatherless, which is who? Every one of us, previously spiritually fatherless and impoverished. We appreciate the physical plight of widows and orphans, and we are moved to go to them in their affliction. We know that apart from the grace of God who visited us in our spiritual affliction, in our sin, that we would not stand a chance with our Holy Father. But praise the Lord, by faith in Jesus, we have been adopted into the family, which should cause us to live out the principle of adoption by practically meeting the needs of widows and orphans, those who cannot care for themselves. Now, let me be clear. This is not something, we like to do this, and I'm going I'm to say guilty, all right? But we like to do this. We like to justify that we're doing this by writing a check to those charities and parachurch organizations that are doing ministry to widows and orphans. And we think, I've done my duty. This is a personal invitation of those whose religion is pure and undefiled in the sight of God, to go into their affliction, filled with gratitude for God's grace. That's what motivates us. I'm so grateful. I've seen the glory of God. I open his word. I behold the glory of God. I also recognize my own sin. Then I'm filled up with encouragement and gratitude because God's a gracious, forgiving God. And then I go out motivated by that, and compassionate toward those who cannot help themselves. And I seek ways to help people that cannot help themselves. Actively looking for ways to live out my religion. I'm not content to be a hearer who hears. I want to be a doer who acts. 
I'm looking for ways to live out my religion, to enter into the affliction of the afflicted and alleviate their suffering however you can. Now, you don't have to do the impossible. James is not expecting you to do the impossible and alleviate suffering of all people. You can't do that. But you can alleviate the suffering of someone that God gives you that God gives you opportunity if you're looking for it. Amen. If you're looking for it. James continues describing right religion when he says and to keep oneself unstained from the world. One of James's primary concerns was the infiltration of the world into the church. He was concerned that the world would influence the church rather than vice versa which I think is certainly a valid concern given what we've seen in history and, frankly, what I see today. How much feminism, pragmatism, secularism, hedonism has infiltrated your worldview. How much of how you do you is infiltrated, is stained by the world? I promise you, you cannot say none. So the question is, to what degree? To what degree do I believe things that are contrary to what the Word says? To what degree do my presuppositions, remember I talked about presuppositions, it's huge. That's why we're in this text, to confront presuppositions. Presuppositions are like the operating system of a computer. It just runs in the background. You're never interacting with it. It just runs. It's just driving you. You don't think about it. It just causes you to live and act in a certain way. And so what we must be doing, since we can't say none of our worldview is stained by the world, Father, give us wisdom from above to identify where our worldview is stained by the world. So what does James mean by the world? The world is a system of thought and values. It, 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 he's describing the prevailing philosophy or theology of those who do not love God nor submit to him. The world is, in the New Testament, the world is almost always exclusively referred to as an evil thing. It's the antithesis of God and his holy nature. And so obviously those anti-God values contradict God's values. So much so that James says in 4.4, you adulterous people. Now listen, this is a pastor talking to his church. And you think I'm the velvet hammer? Come on. Cut me some slack. I'm just going to read what James, what Pastor James read to his people. You adulterous people! Exclamation point. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Raise your hand if you want to be an enemy of God. I don't think so. The world today seems emboldened to flaunt immorality and what the Bible calls sin. It's increasingly calling evil good and good evil. It's increasingly denying and rejecting biblical principles that lend to human flourishing. Just recently, an article came out, a breathtaking, spellbinding article came out in one of the big magazines, secular magazines, that said, young people, you don't have to wait until you're 30 to get married to have a good marriage. Just don't live together before you get married, and you'll probably have a good relationship breathtaking, right? Shocking. What God has given to us is given to us to promote human flourishing. You do it God's way, most likely your life is going to flourish. You don't do it God's way, most likely it's not. It rejects biblical principles like biblical masculinity, 
calling it toxic masculinity. I'm sorry, but the crisis in Ukraine is revealing to us just how much a community needs strong men. Amen? We need strong men who will fight for their families and for their country. Nothing wrong with that. We're applauding something across the globe that we're wondering and questioning and rejecting in our own country. How foolish are we? We need strong men. And how about, ladies, I don't tend to pick on you too much, but how about biblical femininity? We need women to be women. Biblical femininity. I'll let you unpack that. I'll let Kelly unpack that for you. (laughs) Once she's perfected it. You're almost there. First lady, everybody. (laughs) Biblical sexuality. Right? Biblical sexuality. It works. It's great. One man, one woman for life in the context of marriage. Beautiful, wonderful. Nuclear family. Black Lives Matter movement, one of their aims is to destroy the nuclear family. Law and order. True justice. Natural consequences. The world is blatantly calling what is perversion love. The murder of preborn children, reproductive justice. This is evil. It, it takes something that's evil and calls it good. Reproductive justice. Marxism, it calls justice. And it takes a woman's highest calling of motherhood and labels it oppressive. It says, in order for you to be liberated, women, you have to be liberated from childbearing. Until you can be liberated from the constraints of childbearing, you will not be liberated. This is evil, and some of you believe this. I I know this. Some of you have been stained by feminism and pragmatism and hedonism and secularism. Let me be clear. You and I have a Christian duty to test all things and hold fast what is good. And what is implied with the rest? You throw it in the garbage heap where it belongs. To keep oneself unstained by the world is best understood keeping oneself unstained by the world. It implies a perpetual obligation of Christians to abstain from what the Lord calls evil and practice what the Lord calls good. This process requires careful examination of values and presuppositions and should never be disengaged. There's no neutral. You are either being stained by the world or you are keeping yourself unstained by the world. So how do you examine your lifestyle, your presuppositions, your worldview, your, how you do you, how you live life? How do you know that it's not being stained? How do you examine that by not being hearers of the word only, but doers who act? Hear and obey the word. Read and obey the word. That is how you keep yourself unstained by the world. Just state the obvious. If this is the sole nourishment of your week, you are not keeping yourself unstained. You cannot come in here once a week for 50 minutes or 56 if I go over like a half and keep yourself unstained by the world. You need a steady diet of the word. If your strategy is just to accept what everyone around you accepts or even what most Christians accept without working through the examination process yourself, then you ignore Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's no area of your life that gets a pass. Paul treats something as trivial as eating and drinking as important to God and says you need to do that for the glory of God. And notice that it's personal, whether you eat or drink. So there's a perpetual and personal responsibility that each one of us has to try with all the power that the Holy Spirit works in us to live for the glory of God in every single area of our lives. And when we fail, to repent. Look, I know this is weighty. We're going to conclude here. It's weighty if you really consider. If you've really listened to what I've said, it is weighty to consider what James is calling us to. This is religion that is pure and undefiled before God. It goes beyond external big sins, right? External big sins. And it gets to the heart, to the attitude, to the motive of even good things like Bible studies. God cares about why you go to Bible studies. James makes it clear, if you want to know that your religion is one that pleases God, do not consider how much you know. Consider what you're doing with what you know. Remember, the key is not perfection, but rather hating your imperfection and working with all the power that the Holy Spirit works in you to rid yourself of it. But we have to begin at the beginning, not at the beginning of the sermon, the beginning of the gospel. We don't do anything that pleases God without first entering into a faith relationship with Jesus. The Pharisees thought that by knowing enough Bible and doing enough good things that they could please God. Not so. We come to the Father by faith in his Son, or we do not come at all. Brother and sister, do not proceed one more step, one more moment, without giving Jesus your life, mind, body, soul, today. Asking for forgiveness. I hope and pray you've seen the glory of God and you've seen who you really are and you've tested yourself, you've examined yourself, some very practical questions to ask yourself. You know whether you're in the faith. If you're not, get there today. Submit your life to Christ today. Call out for forgiveness today. And then get busy being a doer of the word. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness and kindness. Thank you for rescuing us, adopting us into the family of God. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus, that today would be a day of salvation for them. They would come and they would submit themselves before you. They would ask you for, for salvation, forgiveness of sin, and that, Lord, all of us that know Jesus, we would go out these doors encouraged, filled up by your grace to do what we've heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I wanna encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.